Good morning, everyone. So good to see all of you here as we gather as God's people. Thank you, Elder Bar on. Thank you, our singers and musicians, for leading us in a time of worship. And thank you, Chelsea, for coming to share of God's work in your heart and through your heart to the people of Japan. I hope you found that encouraging. Yep, let's continue to encourage our sister, give her a big hand, and to keep her in prayers and keep us going in this work. Right. I was very tempted after she said yesterday and reminded this morning again of how cool the pastor was in his short sleeve red shirt to go back and change my shirt <laughs> and take off this tie. <laughs> Which leads us to lots of things that we'll find in the Bible passage in front of us. So how well can we read signs? And the world that we live in is full of signs. So the first slide comes on. How well can we read signs? Just going to ask all those who have a driving license here. Can you put up your hands? All those who have a driving license, hands up. Okay. So when you, to, to qualify to have a driving license, you need to go for your classes, you need to take a test, the highway code here in Singapore, right? And <laughs> so after you get your license, how many of you obey the highway code? That's quite different, you know? You might learn all the things. So when you see an amber light, an amber light, is it to prepare you to stop or to accelerate? Most of us, when you see amber light, can I beat this light? Can I beat this light? So it's the same signal, but it's different before you take the test and after you take the test for your license. And in much of Asia, and Singapore included, those who are tuning in, we do apologize for this. When here in Asia, like many parts of Asia, we indicate, right, you're driving along, you indicate you want to turn right or you want to veer left or veer right. Guess what happens to the car behind? Instead of slowing down, which is what they teach you as part of the highway code for safety, they accelerate. <laughs> so you learn the highway code subjectively only to disobey it. You learn all the signs that are there. And so we have a love-hate relationship with signs. We, it is very self-interested. So there are many signs around us, and here are some of them. What do colours on our signs, road signs, actually mean? You mean there's... There's meaning to the colours. The blue stands for something. The yellow stands for something. The red stands for something. And if you go and Google, that's what they tell you. The mandatory signs are blue. The prohibition and fire safety signs are in red. The warning signs are yellow. The first aid emergency signs, like the exit signs here, they are in green, right? So there's colour symbolism. And this is universally adopted. So colours do mean something. And it goes on. If it's prohibition signs, means this one you can't do, you cannot do at all. A mandatory sign, you must do this. A danger sign, you do this, it, will, it might kill you. Right? A warning sign, this might hurt you or hurt somebody. Emergency information signs, this safety first. And fire signs, fire equipment. And so, my mother lived with me for many years until she passed on at 101. She and my father came from China. They were both illiterate. They never went to school. And so signs in, in a different culture mean different things. And we've become so English educated, so Western educated. And the number one place my mom, as she became more and more elderly, was number one place to visit anywhere is the washroom, the toilet, right? So could she read such signs? Okay, what signs? On the left-hand side, maybe, right? As her eyesight faded a little bit, she had to stare a lot harder which one is the man, which one is the woman, right? Then if she meets a sign like that one on the right-hand side, what on earth is she going to make of that? It's not the sign that she knows from her Chinese background, from her illiterate background. Nowadays, we have signs slightly more complicated like this. For the life of me, if my mom was alive, what would she do with this sign, right? And usually, I was the one who accompanied her all the way from my young days, the teenage days, always to the washroom, and so signs sometimes are totally, not just disobeyed, they are unintelligible for us. And so they do not provide. If you're in a hurry, you really have to do the big one. You really need to know which one you have to enter, right? And so did you read the story of this in America, of Keith Mason in, in, Mich in Michigan? And one night in Keith Stonehouse house, the doorbell rang, again and again, and each time he went to the door, there was no one there. There was only food at the front of his door. So he was wondering what happened. Each time he went, the delivery man just disappeared. But he got out in time to stop one of them and said, what's happening here? He says, uh, why are you bringing me all this food? And the food delivery, according to, uh, uh, food delivery driver said, 
I do not know, you ordered it. He said, no, I didn't order it. Then finally he started to think, all the signs, he couldn't make the sense of the signs of food arriving at his doors. He realized he left his handphone for his six-year-old son to play with. And he started ordering on Grubhub. <laughs> and so he, the father called the restaurants frantically to stop the delivery. He says, no, you can't call us. You've got to call Grubhub, right? The one who coordinates all these things. In the end, he, the son ordered, Mason ordered, about $1,000 of food. And so the father and mother had to give that all to their neighbours, etc. And so he didn't read the signs of what was happening, that he had inadvertently, unintentionally left the phone for his son to play with. And so, might as well finish the story, confronted the son, tried, tried to make this a teachable moment, not punish him, but teachable moment, right? That you shouldn't do this, and money is precious, brought out his piggy bank, etc. Then, in the midst of this teachable moment, his son puts up his hand to stop the father and says, um, Dad, I just want to know, did the pepperoni pizzas arrive or not? <laughs> and the father says, I didn't know whether I should get mad or loud. Sometimes we just don't know what the signs mean. All this food arriving at my doorsteps. And so we have signs in our cities. We also have signs in our countryside. I was preaching at a camp in Malaysia years ago. And after that sermon, so this happening it happens in many places. People respond in different ways. There will be some tears and a lot gathered around this lady. And I found out in hindsight that at the moment, while the cam was on, her son, who had gone to study in America, who loved hiking and walking, had gone out to a national park and he was lost. And at that moment, he was, had not been found. And he was never found. Still not found. When we... City slickers go out to a forest, a national park, a jungle. We do not know how to read the signs, which a native, a person who is born there, might know slightly better. Signs can be very lighthearted. They can be life-tracking or life-saving. Once you understand the significance of signs, the Gospel of John is much easier to understand because it's a gospel of signs. Seven signs, to be precise. And so we plunge in and take a look at this. Here's the boy, just in case. Right, Mason, $1,000. <laughs> right, still smiling. So some of those signs are unintelligible. Some of the signs we are intelligible, but we deliberately disobey. Some signs we really can't tell, but signs do carry meaning. And it's important to be able to discern their meaning and whether it applies to us. What about God's signs? What can we make of them? How are they different to our human signs in our world? And so, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana, in Galilee. I think that's how they pronounce it. Like having been to Israel and Turkey, they say, it's not Cana, it's Cana, K-A-N-A. -A, right? And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also was in, invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. A few things to observe when you read the Bible or hear the Bible. The first thing is that John, in 21 chapters of John's Gospel, never refers to Mary, her name. Always refers to her as mother of Jesus. And just in, just in three verses, you see that appear three times. And so... What's the setting? In all likelihood, she's identified. In all likelihood, she's invited by a friend or a relative right, to this wedding banquet. And so Jesus comes along as the second level of guests. Jesus also was invited. So if the mother of Mary, a mother of Jesus, who is Mary, was the one invited, where's Joseph? In one sense, it's not important, it's not there in the text but maybe he had passed on and now she was the head of the household. And Jesus, one of her sons, comes along. He was also invited to the wedding with the disciples whom he had just called, recorded for us in John chapter 1. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, now look at significance. How many weddings have you been to? I do not know. Five? A hundred? Fifty? I'm not sure. 
some of the pastors here, myself, I've, I've been to maybe three, four hundred, conducted three, four hundred of them. Weddings are not an occasion in which you want to be embarrassed. Weddings are an occasion in which you honour parents, you celebrate with friends, and the last thing is to lao kui. For those who are from overseas, lose face. <laughs> and when you run short of wine, you lose face. Because in the ancient world, there are how many kinds of drinks do we have today? There are all manner of drinks. There is Coca-Cola, there's Pepsi-Cola, there are two colas. There's 7-Up, there's Mountain Dew, there is um, ice lemon tea, there's green tea, there's a whole lot of things in between, right? In the ancient world, there were only two beverages, water or wine. And wine, of course, in a special setting. To run short of wine at a wedding feast is an embarrassment. It's a loss of face. And so, who hears about this? It comes up, it comes up to Mary. So she must be quite important because it could have been spread to the other 50 or 100 guests, but it comes up to her. And then she tells Jesus, and Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not come. So a few things need unpacking before we get the real meaning and then work out the real implications for us. And so, the dating and the location becomes important. This is now, it says, the third day, but it's actually the seventh day from the beginning of John's record. Day one, John's testimony, John the Baptist, regarding Jesus. Day two, John encounters the Lord Jesus. Day three, two disciples are called by Jesus. They come to Jesus. That's the first calling. Day four, Andrew introduces his brother Peter to Jesus. Day five, most likely location has shifted to Galilee. right? And here, Philip and Nathaniel follow Jesus. Day six is not explicitly mentioned. But each episode, right, each episode begins with the next day, the next day, the next day. So when you read chapter 2 on the third day, it's the third day from the first day he arrived at Galilee. Can you follow? The wedding at Cana. And so why is third important or seven important? Seven is a number of perfection in the Bible. Third day becomes important in the life of Jesus. Why so? The second part of chapter 2 will unpack it for us. And so it's very simple, this, this record of Jesus' life. The setting, a wedding feast, the crisis, no wine. The solution, Jesus turns water into wine. And so a few things which puzzle us, and first thing that should puzzle us is this. Why on earth is Jesus slightly rude in calling, seems to be slightly rude, in calling his own mother, his own mother, woman, Right? And one commentator says, to understand the whole situation, it could be in a social setting, it's polite distancing from his mother. He doesn't call her, I do not know, among the Israelites, mama, mommy. <laughs> that would be close and intimate, a term of endearment. But in a social setting, it changes, polite distance. Why is this important? Could it be important? More important is to pinch on the word our. He says to her, what does the running shot of wine at a wedding, most likely the wedding of your friend or your relative, have to do with me? And then he puts in a word that needs unpacking, my hour, it's not my hour yet. And so the hour refers to something. It's the same crisis, they ran short of wine. Embarrassment, big time, for a wedding couple and a wedding family. Right? But from a human perspective, this is like a spoiler, a party pooper. It's a loss of face. But no matter what you face in life, you, you know, lose your face at a wedding, you lose your face at a job, you lose your face at a social setting, it is a passing crisis. It reaches a climax and in a few years' time, you'll laugh at it. But Jesus is referring his heart and his mind. His calendar was on a different thing. It is about the hour. The Greek word is hora, H-O-R-A, transliterated. For him, the hour in John's Gospel is a symbol. The hour is a symbol of his suffering, climaxing in his sacrificial death for us. And that's the real crisis and the real climax, which is mine and his heart and God's divine timing for him is locked into. That's why it sounds like he's a little bit, a little bit distant, a little bit abrupt or rude with his mother. He's not. He's saying 
What does this have to do with me? It's not for the time for me to reveal who I truly am. But out of His grace, He does change the water into wine. And so it all has to do with the introduction that we call the prologue. And the prologue we're introduced to the, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then we'll move on to say that nothing has been created without the Word. All things were created by the Word, through the Word, for the Word. And Paul will echo that in, in Colossians chapter 1. So the eternal Word that has always been there with God, which turns out to be Jesus, God's Son in the flesh, is the Creator Word and soon will become the saving Word. God sends this Word into your world and my world. The Word becomes flesh. So from John 2, the first part of John chapter 2, it's about the Creator Word. As much as He was the Creator as the pre-existing Word, now that the Word has become flesh, He's creating this right in front of us. Something that only He can do, but we cannot do. What is it you and me can do? You and me are totally capable of turning wine into water. Now, mind you, didn't catch that joke, but it's all right. It will take you a while to ponder that. But only Jesus can do the reverse of turning wine, right, water into wine. So He's displaying that He is Creator as the incarnate Word. And why is this important? Then it moves on to another word besides hora, hour, that you must understand. Is it the right hour for him to show this sign? And what do the signs actually point to? The signs slowly reveal that this Jesus, Jesus, born where, born where? Born in a nowhere place in Jerusalem, in a backwater, right? A totally unknown place that this Jesus is actually the Christ, the Messiah. And that's what the Jews today still do not believe, that this nobody person from a nobody place is actually the most important person. He is the Christ. And so the signs, they are stunning, they are incomparable, they are unique. And the word that we like to use is awesome. Unique and awesome means uh, is one and only. So you and me must never say this, but for me is awesome. There will be other but for me is better than this. There's only one person you should use the word for. Unique and awesome belongs to God and belongs to Jesus. And so what are the seven signs he performs in the gospel? The seven signs that are stunning, extraordinary, unique, awesome, unrepeatable, incomparable are this. So much wine, 120 gallons. You know what's that? 120 gallons, they say, is about 450 litres. 450 litres is 300 of your big bottles of of soft drinks that you buy because it's 1.5 litres. If you buy wine, it's 700 mils or 750 mils. It's 600 of those bottles. It's not just so much, but it's so superior. And you read the story's account is, hey, in an average wedding, most people, by the end of the wedding, in the first part, people drink, drink. Then by the end of the wedding banquet, they are slightly high already, slightly intoxicated. They don't know whether you're serving them wine or vinegar. Do you, do you know the difference? There is a difference, like, slightly, like, right? But <laughs> this one that Jesus said, the very best wine comes at the end, not the vinegar, the lousy wine comes at the end. It's not just so much, but so superior. In 446, the official son is critically ill, and Jesus heals the son from a distance. Very unlike many of the so-called healers today in some of the churches. They say they are gifted with healing. And almost every disease can be healed. And usually you have to be up close and personal for them to put their hands on you and to push you down and be slain in the spirit with lots of question mark on whether it's really from God. Is it slain by the spirit or pushed by the healer? I'm not so sure. And so he just pronounces his healing from a distance. The power of his word. The power of his word. So right now in this hall, my word is, is audible. And my word, in one sense, is it powerful? I'm, I'm not sure. Is the word powerful? My word is not powerful. My word, if it explains God's word, is powerful. Okay? Beyond these four doors, it's useless. Right? Can you imagine a word that transcends time and space? So I can speak as loudly as I can. Be healed! But it's trapped by four doors. It's useless. Jesus' word is not bound by space and time. 
It doesn't need amplification. It's just the living word of God. He says it and it's done. Can you follow? That's the word become flesh. And 5, 1 to 15, an invalid, invalid for 38 years. That means his whole body, the muscles have all weakened. Medical word is atrophy. If you ever have to go for a knee operation or any part of your body, after the operation, your muscles weaken because you can't use that part. You have to go to your physiotherapist to work up the strength. An invalid for 30 years gets up and walk. No need physiotherapy. What on earth do you call that? Stunning, extraordinary, unrepeatable, awesome. 6, 5, one to, uh, 5 to 13. He feeds. So how many people did you feed at reunion dinners? Those of us who are Chinese. I have 20 of relatives. You have so many relatives. Lah, right? 30 relatives, so many. Lah. How about trying feeding hundreds or thousands? Jesus just did it. In 6.16, he walks on water. John doesn't record that as a, as a sign, but the commentators include it most likely as a sign. In 9.1-7, sight for the lifelong blind man. In 11.4, it reaches a climax. He raises Lazarus from the dead. Why don't you try it at the cemetery? Why don't you try it at the crematorium? To your friend or your family who passed on, come forth. Father, come forth. Nothing will happen. So how do you read the signs that point to Jesus? It's vitally important. The signs in our world, you can choose to ignore, you can choose to disobey, or plead ignorance or unintelligibility or incomprehensibility. But the signs that come from God, you and I have no right to plead. I do not know what it means. So with the water jars for purification, you need to understand this. In John 2-4, to there's a collection of five episodes from Jesus' life. Just five out of the thousands of episodes in his three and a half years of public ministry. And John collates them. He says, I picked them up so that you will be able to understand the signs and finally put faith in Jesus. And so the water for purification, the Jews, if they walk in from the dusty roads, etc., if they ever meet a Gentile, they say, I've been contaminated. I'm a Jew. I, I met a, a Gentile. I need to wash. So they put their hands into the jars of water to wash before they go in for the feast. The water for purification is no needed, not needed anymore. Because it's, it's replaced by Jesus' cleansing. The corrupt temple will be replaced by Jesus, the true temple, the pure temple. The Jewish birthright in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, a religious leader, comes up to him and says, I don't understand what you're doing. I don't understand what you're talking about. And they thought that just because they plead Abraham as their spiritual forefather, just because they plead that God chose them, they are automatically the children of God and they will enter heaven. And Jesus says, no. You can plead Abraham, but you're not going to enter. You have to be born again. And Nicodemus said, what? Go back to my mother's womb to be born again? No, you have to be born again from above. And by that, he meant to believe in Jesus who's come as God's ultimate sign. And then he meets the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. And she's, she's got relationships. How many relationships have you had? How many loves have you had? How many men and women have you lived with? In close proximity or intimacy, she has seven. Seven affairs. And Jesus knew that. And Jesus said that to her. You're looking for your identity and your security in relationship after relationship. You ain't got to find it. You're not going to find it. Even as you come to Jacob's well, I'm going to give you the springs of living water. No longer will the Jews worship in Jerusalem and boast about it. No longer will the Samaritans boast at Mount Gerizim, this is the true mountain. They will now worship in spirit and in truth that comes from Jesus. It's all about the centrality and the supremacy of Jesus. Is Jesus or nothing? It would have been totally staggering to them. Is Jesus or nothing? And so what does that mean for you and me? From the original context to our context, there's no more need for ceremonial washing. The only person who can wash you clean of sin and present you to the holy God, holy and blameless, welcomed by Him to eternity, is Jesus. Believing in Him and baptized into Him. Now Jesus washes us clean 
And why the third day? Why does John record this as the third day in Galilee? Because on the third day, he rose again. It's not just that he died, but he rose that finally vindicates us and presents us as the cleansed people of God. And so you're welcome straight. No need to do this cleansing bit, cleansing bit. So how many of you, are, how many of you would like us to return that wherever you went in any public building, you still have to do your test? Your ART test, your PCR test, you have to do X, Y, Z. You have to go through all those things. How many of you are looking forward to the return to those days? You say, come see you. Thank God. There's no need. I go straight into the building. You know how hard it was? They closed off everything for one entry point. Why do you think they do that? To, to make sure you're not infected, that you don't get part of this contagion. There's no longer need to do that. You don't have to wash, you don't have to test. You just believe in Jesus with all your heart and say to Him, only you can cleanse me. And you're welcome straight to the heavenly banquet. It's Sunday, it's about 12.45. You're slightly hungry. What does this have to do with you before I let you go for lunch? You say, ah, you go with the same message every week. Lah. It's Jesus, lah. show on. Show on. Show on, what? it's about Jesus. What can I say? This is my joy and my happiness. If today you had an accident, today you were struck with a heart attack, and I just met one or two after service, right? Will you go to heaven? Whatever you don't sort out, you better jolly well sort that out, you know? Just in case you think you have tomorrow to sort it out. Because today could be my last day. Is that right? Today could be your last day. And you, what are you going to plead? You wash yourself clean somewhere? How? Who washed you clean? Surely I cannot wash you clean because I don't know what your sins. And even you confess all your sins to me, I can't do anything about them. I will just say, I'm sorry. It is Jesus alone. Amen? So you make sure that you find your salvation in Christ and Christ alone. This is not a Bible passage you want to hear and say, ah, oh, it's about a wedding lah. Whose wedding lah? It's whether you arrive at heaven which Jesus displays as a wedding banquet. You are either there seated with him enjoying the beauty of this wedding banquet or you are not invited and you will be at a place called hell where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. No banquets there. Just hell. Just pain, just eternal separation from God. So sort it out. The second part of chapter 2, the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. The temple area was huge and it goes from the outer courts where the Gentiles could enter then only the Jews could enter, then only the Jewish men could enter, and then the innermost is only the high priest could enter once a year. Because in the Holy of Holies, that's the very presence of the Holy God. Which means sin cannot enter. Sin, you need a sacrificial system to wash you clean, to make atonement for you before you enter. And so if the outer courts are used for selling all these things, it's very convenient for the Jews, but the Gentiles cannot go there to worship. Because the space for the Gentiles to welcome Gentiles has been occupied wrongly. So it's convenient for the Jews because they come in from all the different parts and you always need to buy sacrifices. So you need to change the Roman coinage, the Roman currency into the temple currency because they will only accept temple currency to buy the sacrifices which you need to buy to enter and worship in the temple. And so the temple area for the Gentiles, the temple for the Jews, had totally lost its meaning. That please be aware, you are walking into the presence of the Holy God. You are walking in the presence of the Holy God. And please know the importance of this, that you need to search your heart and you need to know that God is merciful and gracious and loving towards you. That's why you can enter. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. 
His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. A quotation from Psalm 69 verse 9. So I told you, what was on Jesus' heart? And what was on Jesus' mind? It was the Father's hour. The Father's hour for the world was his death. His agenda was the Father's timetable to fulfill this. And so an important thing to take note is, we have to summarize, Jesus' body now becomes the temple. Right? So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days, see the significance of three? On the third day, he went to Cana. Now, in three days, I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up again in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body, when therefore he was raised from the dead, on the third day, obviously, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So the temple was totally corrupt from leaders to people, from people to leaders, superficially there but not there in worship of God. No loving of God with all their heart and mind and soul and no loving of neighbour. None of that was happening. But they still turned up at the temple, bought the sacrifices and were totally grieving God's heart. And so the temple had to be destroyed. Notice Jesus come, didn't come to destroy the temple literally. He came to destroy the temple in its spiritual significance. Look at that final verse there in verse 22. They believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken, which means that Jesus' word is equal in authority to scripture. For the Jews, that would have been staggering. This is not a small town rabbi and what he said cannot be dismissed. What he said, what he said, what he teaches is equal to God's word in the entire Old Testament and Bible. So that's why all two, three hundred of us here at 11.30 a.m. service have to listen. For all who tune in, you have to listen. Not because a preacher is preaching but because Jesus is speaking. And Jesus' body is now God's temple. The meeting place between the holy God and his holy people is no longer a place, but the person of Jesus. You read the epistle of Hebrews, Jesus is both temple, priest, and sacrifice. All three things he fulfills. He's the sacrifice, he's the lamb. He's also the great high priest. He's also the temple of God. Because no one can, can present us holy and blameless, except the Lamb of God who was introduced to us. And so why is this important? And see how it ends. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, and most likely it's an initial visit to Jerusalem because the other Gospels will record a final visit to Jerusalem where he will again overturn the tables and do this. Many believed. Many believe in his name. Why? Many believe in his name. Can you read it for me? When they saw the, the signs. So the signs were a pointer to who he was. Small town boy, but big time Messiah, end time Messiah. Please understand that. He saw the signs he was doing. But he should have said, and Jesus, seeing that many believe in him because of the signs, rejoice and praise God. It doesn't say, and Jesus. The connecting word is, but Jesus. But Jesus on his part, did not entrust himself to them, you know, did not entrust himself to them. Five words, actually translates one Greek word, belief. Jesus did not believe in them. And why is it he did not believe in them? Because he knew all people and needed no one to bear testimony about men. What is it Jesus knows about you and me? That he doesn't need another man's testimony. He knows your heart and my heart. For he knew, he himself knew what was in the man. So two words there, believe, did not entrust, which is belief. The word believe is very important. We showed you that in the prologue. It appears about 19, 98 times in 21 chapters in different forms. And so it is by believing in Jesus that you and me, in John chapter 3, for God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him, shall not perish, 
but have eternal life. And importantly, what is it? So lessons on science and faith, they are the signs. The signs are to lead them to faith in Jesus. The signs are not an end in itself. So know the difference between signage and destination. How many of you look at the road sign and say, this road sign is beautiful. The road sign is to take you to a destination. You never sit there and eulogize and glorify the road sign. So, oh, the road sign is number 38. Uh, whatever road, I've arrived at this. The destination is your point. The signs were reliable. Their faith was fickle. Why? What stood between their faith? Their faith was self-focused and self-interested. And Nicodemus, he said, will come up to him as the top religious leader. He's gone to the Harvard, the, the religious school of, of Israel. He doesn't understand all our practice of Judaism will not get us into heaven. We, being the children of God, will not get us into heaven. No, it won't. You have to be born again. So what stood in this place was his self-sufficiency from religion. Samaritan woman, you can keep chasing after men. You can have one affair after the other. You can keep looking for your identity and your security in, in, in love. You will never find it. You will always thirst. You will never find yourself in human love. Don't go looking for love in the wrong people. Go looking for love at the cross in Jesus. And so Jesus has come to bring heart change forever. So for us to see Jesus clearly, you have to see your own heart clearly. Or what might stand in the way of you acknowledging that only He can save me. When you look into your heart, Nicodemus, it might be your morality, it might be your integrity, it might be your, your practice of ministry that stands in the way. And you must not trust in those things to get you right with God. And for the Samaritan woman, right, what stood in the way was she was looking for that one jigsaw puzzle, just that one love that will make her feel totally secure. They say men look for significance, women look for security. And where do women look for security? In relationships. So where are you? If Jesus now examines your heart, what will he find as the number one barrier? Standing in your fickle, superficial, shallow faith in him. And unless you acknowledge, you confess, you repent, you surrender, you crucify this idol in your life, which is your self-redemption, you will never need Jesus as your Saviour and your Lord. So next week is new member services. New member services, we all have the testimonies. And so we have to read them, edit them to make sure the language is okay. So I read one, right? So that's the privilege of pastor. I read first, then you read. Lah. Jesus is my liberator and my Saviour. Because the question is, what does Jesus mean to you now for your testimony? Jesus is my liberator and my Saviour. This is why growing up, insecurities and pride rule my life. What rule his life? Insecurities and pride. You think he's alone? I don't think so. Because you are a bundle of insecurities and you're a bundle of pride. I needed acceptance. How many of you need acceptance? All the time you are needing acceptance. Your children need acceptance in school by the peer pressure. You need acceptance. I needed acceptance. I needed excellence. I was an unknowing slave who sought to gain these things at all costs. However, what I found instead was low self-esteem and a depressing emptiness. For a large part of my short life as a young man, my main purpose was to gain acceptance and recognition. Who doesn't want acceptance and recognition? Right? This led me down a path of low self-confidence instead and self-deprecation. I would think to myself, I'm so stupid, I'm so slow, I'm so worthless. Failures and personal inadequacies were unacceptable to me. I seem to be bought up like that, but deep in, I really chop. These things really mattered to me. They hindered me from acceptance after all. In hindsight, it was all because of my pride. So, as John Bloom puts it, a writer puts it, he quotes, it's largely due to thinking more highly of myself than I ought to think and wanting others to admire me more than I deserve. My shame comes from my exaggerated high self-image that exposes my limitations and weaknesses. When I realised the acceptance I wanted would never come from people that who mattered most, the desire steadily morphed, evolved into excellence. 
So the more he wanted acceptance, the more he had to be excellent. And he couldn't be excellent, he kept failing. And so this went on until he totally collapsed from spiritual, mental, emotional exhaustion. Is that you? There's always something in your heart, always something in your heart of self-redemption. You think you can rescue yourself, you can't. By God's grace, a friend questioned him about his faith. Then a friend brought him to Christ, uh, brought him to ARPC, and then he remembered something. Jesus, my Saviour, said, though I'm far worse than I ever thought, it's now my privilege that Jesus is more excellent than I could ever imagine. Something like Pastor Chris said, lah, something along these lines. Lah. You are far worse than you ever thought, and Jesus is far better than you ever imagined. And that's the picture that is here for us. Jesus knows you true and true, but He knows us not to condemn us. He knows us to save us. We know John 3.16, but I'm challenging my leaders and my whole church to know John 3.17. You know what John 3.17 is? God sent His Son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Jesus knows you not to condemn you. He knows you to love you. And some of you could sit there feeling so condemned. You're striving between these polarities of one foot wanting acceptance, one foot striving for excellence, but failing miserably and losing yourself in that. Don't stay there forever. Jesus knows that. And Jesus wants to rescue you from that. Right? Thursday night, we had two official dinners to go to, so I sent Mona to one and I went to the other, both good gospel connections. She went to focus on the family. Focus on the family. The mini ministry is family. La. Focus on the family. La. Right? So it was Minister Shamugan, guest of honour. All races were invited because it was a platform. So Malay Muslims were there. Indian Hindus were there. Chinese Christians were there. Chinese Buddhists were there. Long and short, I said, Mona, can you summarise what, what was the main takeaway for the night? Every race, racial group was there. Every racial group said, number one problem we face, number one problem we face for, can you fill that in? Number one problem we face across the board. In front of the minister and the panel, pornography. Pornography. You think you can hide that and deal with that by yourself? By pressing erase on your phone and you all go well? You think God doesn't know what goes on in your heart? You're trying to escape the harshness of this world by this pleasure that makes you a slave to it. So you could be slave to pride, to a possession, to a pursuit, to excellence. You can be enslaved to a pleasure that numbs you from life. Don't go there. God did send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. And so for the first time, our whole denomination is going to organize. Right? Watch. So that you have the right response to Jesus. Jesus deserves, desires and demands that you give your whole life. You come just as you are. He knows you and He forgives you and He loves you. So how well can we read God's sign? You must say there's only one who can love me and save me. It is Jesus. So we are privileged to organize this for our English Presbytery. The family conference, the family is defined spiritually, it includes singles, it includes married, it includes the elderly, it includes the young, it includes boys and girls and men and women. Come to this. As we as a whole denomination make progress as we cling on to this. The registration opens for all 16 churches at 2pm. We reserve some seats for us. So first come, first sir, right? 2pm, sign up for this. And through three talks, we're going to unpack God's blueprint. God's good design for us and then the next day our good desire for the godly habits and God's good design that it's not just navel gazing, it's about God not just saving us but God using us. Unthinkably, He uses us for Him. And is that right? So what kind of response do you think Jesus deserves? The kind of response that Chelsea gives. Why should Chelsea go back for a nine year on the field? Then after eight years, she can count, who can she count? One person who was converted, one who was helper, and a handful of children responding to it. It's still at 0.5% of converts in this 
nation of 130 million people. But what sends her back again and again? She looks upon the Lord Jesus as she said in her testimony, from a distance like a crowd and marvel at his signs and marvel at him. And as she gets closer and closer, he's more and more beautiful, he's more and more beautiful. Do you see the signs? And do you see that they point to the Savior of the world? Amen? There is no one else who knows you better. No one else who knows your sinfulness. And no one else who can do something about you. And then after He saves you and me, He uses you and me in all your fickleness, in all your feebleness, to be an instrument of His salvation. That's the gospel, brothers and sisters in Christ. How well can you read God's signs? You read it well when you give the right response of, I'm sorry for my sin and I believe in Jesus as my Saviour and my Lord. Make something of my broken life. That's how you give the right response to Him. Amen? Let's stand and pray together. Father, we live in a world of many signs. Sometimes the signs we don't understand, sometimes they are unintelligible. Sometimes they are signs which we plainly understand but plainly disobey. But above all, give us spiritual eyes to see all the signs that point to Jesus as our Saviour and our Lord. We thank you in your word that you tell us that you know us. You know what was going on in Nicodemus' life. You know what's going on in the Samaritan woman's life. And through it all, you are the word become flesh. You have not come to condemn us. You have come to save us. And so we give our life to you, thanking you that you have come to save us for God's glory. In your mighty name we pray.